All right, this is an episode of Whitetail Cribs. Unlike any other, this is with Jason Michael in Eastern Pennsylvania. And Jason has been a bit of a whitetail gypsy over the last few decades, hunting all across the country. And you get to check out all of his favorite deer and favorite stories on Mark Martin Motors in Eastern Pennsylvania. Doesn't have a traditional crib, but this is worth watching. Here we go. Hey guys, I'm Jason Michael. Welcome to Africa, Pennsylvania. Come on in the dealership and take a look at some of my deer. Welcome to the wall, guys. And here's the truth of the story. When we were gonna do this back in the day, we were trying to put some things together. It's called Whitetail Cribs. And I'm like, Chad, I don't have a crib, but I have a place now that I can put the deer on the wall. And I just definitely wanna thank Mark Martin Motors, again, here in Ephrata, Pennsylvania. And today I got 35 heads and skulls here, and I got a couple more at home and some being mounted yet. So I'm somewhere around 40, and I'd say 35 of them would probably fall into that Pope and Young class, even around the net mark but we'll just take a look at a couple here and highlight them and take a look this here is what personally started it all off for me uh, i was probably 21 years old actually till i shot my first deer and put an arrow in it and it was pennsylvania and i was in the air force and i come home from korea and i had a limited time to hunt and i just distinctly remember it it was october 12th and i went in the evening before and set a stand and got out of there taking a chance kind of being in that core but this was the absolute first year I ever shot an arrow at. And it grossed Pope and Young and ended up netting Pope and Young. So lucky break there. Uh, Northern Central Pennsylvania netted right close to 126 and grossed a little over 129. This here would have been just about the second buck I got on. I had shot some other smaller deer that aren't here. This deer also was Pennsylvania. And we jumped up, especially for an eight point in that same two, three mile wheelhouse in Pennsylvania, had 11 inch G2s and getting up there around 18, 18 and a half inch spread, ended up being 140 and an eighth gross and netted somewhere around 137. And both those Pennsylvania deer, I had scored and entered in for Pope and Young and have the certificate for them. And then here is a deer. I have some good footage of this deer. This was Missouri. Uh, filmed probably I would say this about 10 years ago right up close to the Iowa line maybe within 20 miles of the Iowa line this deer ended up being 154 and we used that for a video promotional thing back in the day of, with a group I was involved with so that was pretty cool uh, this particular deer right here is like I said to the guys earlier is probably without a doubt the smallest deer I would have score wise on the wall especially in the in in the group that are mounted but it's a seven point and i have history with him and i have this very exact shed that looks almost identical and it's probably like not even quite 10 percent smaller but it's identical just that three point side and this deer really i would want to say they say blowed up he didn't so much score wise he's maybe in the low 120s for a seven point just a just a lot of character to that deer the way his rack is and uh I had a lot of history with him on camera for two years. And uh, I was saying to Cam earlier today, it's getting to be the theme for me, like the last three bucks I've killed uh, in Kansas over the years. Most of them been coming in the month of December, early to middle of December. So that was pretty cool. I think that was a December 9th deer. And then this deer is the only deer out of say the 40 of the skulls and antlers that I have. And there was some small stuff from back in, in my mid twenties and stuff that isn't here, but that was right at 160. I didn't even make it to the tree stand and it's the only deer I've ever rifle shot. And he's a whopping, I think 13 and an eighth inches wide inside, but he pushed right there at 160, just a scratch or two over it. And he's got a 13 inch tine back there. So that really helped out. This was a really, really cool deer. It's probably the only time uh, over the years. There was one other deer here. I had my dad in on the hunt filming, but this one top to bottom we got and he's a whopping 14 and an eighth inches inside but again you got those pair of 12s back there and both main beams scratched or went just a little over 25 inches so that really helped him out and as you can see a little reflection here that form that's on that deer does him justice it was just a, a house of a deer a really long body deer and in that area of the southeast corner they're a little more pit bull like a little more stubby looking but he was just a great great character deer and then this particular buck was one of the shortest quickest but yet i'm going to tell you of, of of all the deer that are here there's very few times that there's more than one set two sets and at the most three sets it just worked out that's the way we set up for him 
and we don't hunt until we have to until the time's right. And this deer was the first evening I went in on a region of public ground, really remote, parked and, and walked for 45 minutes on even like a combine farm road just to get to where I wanted to. So November 17th in the evening, and it was kind of what you call a snow shower with the sun out. Then it got a little blinded out by some snow and then the sun come back out. And again, November 17th, and he pushed a doe down by me, took his time with her, and he had a little eight point that he kept keeping an eye on and uh, ended up getting a real good arrow in that deer. He's got a fish hook on the back and uh, just a lot of character to him. About 154 is what we come up with on him. This particular critter, I was with a kid on some private ground in Fulton County and he's like, just go set up, just do your thing. We hunt this part of the farm. And, and uh, so I hung a stand and went in the very next morning and that was just one of those things where I seen the deer. I hadn't rattled or grunted or done anything blind. But that particular deer, I seen him coming from probably 250, 300 yards away. So he held up for a little bit and I had that deer at probably 80, 90 yards and I hit him good with a snort wheeze. And he hesitated a little bit looking around. I hit him again, got his attention a little more. And from 80 yards till the time the arrow hit him, I'm going to estimate was a minute and a half. And just, you know, a particular thing I remember about that deer, obviously seeing that third main beam coming with some extra brow in there. He was a low 140s deer. It's just the amount of blood. I just distinctly remember the, the, the blood that he drained out on the ground, the blood that come out of his nostrils, his mouth, just really hit really hard, cut the top of the heart off in the lower lung. And uh, yeah, that deer was just really cool. This one here of everything on the wall here was the only deer that rings a bell with me. And it's funny, I have to think of that, that was straight up with an outfitter. And I was in Buffalo County, Wisconsin and that deer ballpark that was about uh, seven eight years ago and we had a lot of windy weather early in the pre-rut early in the scraping phase and i'm going to tell you the date on that deer he was shot the evening of october 22nd getting in on him getting set up i remember they got us close with the four wheelers and then walked us switched back us up to the top of all the bluff country in buffalo county uh really really killer footage of him coming in and it was just uh really windy still and you can see in the footage when he comes in there how he scraped and went through his routine. He almost surprised us because of the wind. And I had a hired gun with me with two or three different angles with the GoPro and everything worked out really good. Uh, the deer only went 30 yards, but we did not see that deer go down. So, you know, you're like, man, what happened? I know I hit him pretty good. And I walked over to where the scrape was, turned my head, looked down and there he was. This one kind of lived out in some open territory and it's kind of characteristic you know if you fish for largemouth bass in a shallow pond they're kind of bleached out they don't have that good dark color like bass do with lily pads and some logs and deep water this is kind of an open prairie kansas deer even though it was southeast corner just not a lot of habitat and cover there and uh i had a friend in hunting and he seen the deer and had no luck that week and he left and i went back into that area and made a small move at that time, it was a big deal. I didn't have a range fire or anything, but we went back in later and that was 39 yards. And I didn't hit that deer as good as I should have and started to worry. And I had another group there that went out and helped me find it. And I was 20 yards from finding it when I did quit. An hour or two after I hit it, I went and looked. But he ended up being right at the 40 mark to the low 40s, little crooked, but just a cool deer. And again, just me being an opportunist back in the day, that was just a free hunt, public land, Kansas deer. And then this guy on the end over here, that's, uh, yeah, that's, that was a pretty cool story. That was a straight up, put the antlers together, smash them, smash them, make some sound, just call them blind, took a chance. And it was the first set, November 4th, because that's my deer. That's the deer that I use the examples of three years in a row in Iowa, November 4th, November 4th, November 4th. And that was an evening buck and he came in, there was still an hour of daylight left. And he just came walking, came to the scrape, didn't even acknowledge it, and was going to keep on going through. He was, that headgear was looking. I seen it coming probably 80 yards away and uh, kind of some thick habitat there. And he came out into the open red oaks where I was. But that deer, when you look at him straight on, you know, he's 24 and 3 eighths wide at the widest point outside. But that brow tine is 10 and a quarter, just not quite. And then it's forked like a mule deer there. That brow tine's the tallest tine in the air on that deer, even over the G2s and G3s. So that was really cool, big deal, a lot of character. But we'll go over here and look at some of these skulls. 
and different times I've been asked over the years, you know, why didn't you mount that one? Why didn't you mount that one? And maybe I had one at the taxidermist. And again, being what I call real world and being realistic and a low budget hunter financially, never really having the dollars to do much with it, but having time on my hand, that's one of the ultimate benefits I've ever personally had. Several of these deer should be mounted and I just didn't have the dollars to do it. And this deer here, we'll just jump right to him. Everybody goes, well, what's the biggest deer you ever killed? And this, without a doubt, is in uh, first place by almost 10 inches. So that was just a really cool deer. And again, just me being an opportunist, maybe putting out what cameras I can, different places of the country and, and whatnot. Um, never had a picture of him, never had any history with him. And kind of the case with a handful of these deer here, the majority of them, just being an opportunist, reading sign, reading the train and logging hours in the right place, that's how this deer got killed. And I used a canoe in a river system that kind of goes into a lake in uh, South Central Iowa. And it just worked out and that was a November 7th deer. So it was in the evening, come out pushing a doe and he almost left her. And I snort wheezed and brought him back even though she was right there by me, she didn't really mind it. I had to take a chance and that ended up working out good. And uh, this is what you'll call a 171 and a half is what we come up with ballpark but just a really cool deer. And uh, that's my Booner. If anyone asks, did you ever kill a Booner? There he is. This guy, I'm gonna pull him off here to look at him. He just had a lot of character. This is just one of those things. This deer ended up being uh, 153, not quite 154. A little bit going on here. And his, his tines just twist. They twist like a candy cane going up here, kind of on both sides. And he's a little bladed there. And uh, this was kind of what you'll call the Burger King buck. And I get in a little quarry in behind uh, the city limits of a particular town in Kansas, I won't say, but just a really cool deer, one set. I had trail cam pictures of him, bait station was there, and I hunt off that bait station probably 80 yards. And I like to actually, when I get their pattern down, know they're coming to it. I wanna be there and get on them before they get to it, because sometimes they're a little edgy when they get 30, 40 yards away, and I wanna have an arrow in them before they get that. So I do use the bait station to my advantage in those cases, but I won't necessarily hunt directly over it. This guy right here, this is a no-no in the big boy world, especially the management world, but anybody that knows about deer and has property and has the opportunity to, to pass on deer, this is the one you let go. He's 145 and 1 8th, but he is the most immaculate deer. Tip to tip, he's a little upwards here, but other than that, side to side was absolutely immaculate. Three and a half year old, again, 145 strong. Gosh, is that the deer you wanna see make it to five and a half and in the big boy world with all that property, six and a half if he could ever do it. But just a lot of character, a lot of trail cam pictures of him went in, one set up, and again, getting into that first late week of December and uh, just worked out good coming through doing his thing. This guy, we can get him off the wall. This one here, just to, just even to hold this rack, it's just so dense, a lot of good history with him for that particular season, not over a two, three year period where you just see the one, the two and the three just had a lot of character and then a very distinct point here. And at first I see him, you know, not good trail cam pictures. I'm like, man, that's a really good eight. And I didn't, get to see all this at first and then as the weeks went by and I was in and out of Iowa and going on the elk hunts and coming back through I'm like wait a minute same scrape same time same region I got in a hickory tree off the highway and the, you could hear the tractor trailers and stuff running I'd sat and look at my truck from the tree stand but I ended up seeing him come out and there was two other smaller bucks with him and they went on up in above and started sparring and that kept his attention so I started snort wheezing to him and I'd snort wheeze again. He'd look at them, he'd look back at me, and about the third time I snort wheezed, he started giving the dickens to a bush, and I got really good footage of him beating that, that brush up, and then I turned the camera on me and filmed myself. But this is, uh, this deer was a poke, and it wasn't the best shot angle, but the deer was dead in probably eight to 10 seconds. Just a really heavy hitter, 23 and an eighth wide, and this deer scratched 160. And then the rest of these here, not counting some that I laid down and showed you, but just a variety of deer from Illinois, Kansas. This one here was a really cool deer and meant a lot at the time. It was a big deal to get over five inch bases and it was just a three by three. Really good photos. And you'd see in the photo, I look like a kid. It was probably 16, 18 years ago, but just a real heavy hitter from Northern Central Pennsylvania. And that worked out. And this deer literally, I've sat there and stared at his bed. I said, I'm gonna try and crack this deer 
right in his bed. Got one in him and he didn't make it far, but that was really cool. Good deer for Pennsylvania. Pretty cool story. This deer pushing the 20 inch mark, not much more. And he's probably, you know, like that 130, 133 type deer. That was Bow Hunter Magazine. We did an article on that, mapping out your hunts and, and going around the country and how to pick and choose your battles on public ground. Cool story here, but a short story. I won't, won't waste anybody's time with it, but to me, this deer taught me probably more than any three deer on this wall. This was uh, south central, way down in the bottom, maybe 20 miles, 25 miles from Kentucky, south central Ohio buck. And uh, he had some 12 inchers back there, that side anyway, and a good G3. January 17th, six degrees at night. It was minus every night. And this was be, this, this coming January will be four years ago. So that deer, a lot of history. I mean, trying to bait him, trying to not hunt the bait, stay away from it, but just bait because of inventory. Just a really cool critter, good frame. 151, 152 we had him at and uh just real cagey and the only time i seen him is when i actually got to put an arrow in him i had a couple sets in that region some other deer around some other nice deer and uh but that deer really tested me just really tested me and then along the bottom here kansas deer kansas deer this deer right here the only deer like this one up here was the only deer i've ever shot with a rifle this was the only deer I've ever had a chance to shoot at with an inline muzzleloader. And uh, it was Kansas many moons ago up in the northwest corner. I got brought in to do a hunt on some ground for a television show. And uh, old, old deer. They, they talked about this deer in another particular one, knowing it's probably in the mid-20s. But just beastly body. Good recovery. Good shot. I think, don't hold me to this, inline muzzleloader. 13 yards was the shot where this deer was rubbing on like a little cedar. He had the center of it stripped out, but just even in the photos, the Roman nose, probably one of those deer, to be very honest with you, and you'll see the pictures of him maybe like a seven and a half year old, just a, just a giant deer, but just not much for a rack. And it was time for him to go and let the other younger deer with good genetics live. So I felt good doing them a favor on their property. And then back in here, uh, that was a Kansas deer from, boy, back in the day. Again, I, there was times I would stay in my truck, and I was out in the vastness of it. And I don't mind saying where the area was at the time, uh, be a place called Chautauqua County, Kansas. And the main town, the main hub of that, uh, I think the town's like six, eight miles from the Oklahoma border, would be Sedan, Kansas. And that's where that was. And I got to be honest, even back in the day, we just didn't see much pressure. But of all the places in the country... Texas and Oklahoma, some of Arkansas, some of Mississippi, was starting to infiltrate that southeast region of Kansas. And again, this is 20 years ago, 22, 23 years ago. The leasing really started catching on. So that was a big deal. And that was when I got that first taste of that in my mid twenties. And that's it. And I hope you enjoy. Hope you guys enjoyed this episode of Whitetail Cribs. And if you want to support what we're doing here, head over to our website, exodusoutdoorgear.com. Check out our Exodus render. It is an incredible, reliable cell camera for this upcoming season backed by a five-year no bs warranty and also we just launched a new line of exodus mmt tailored arrows you can go over there put the inputs of what you're shooting and you'll get tailored made arrows shipped to your door we still have a little bit of time here for the october one opener so be sure to head over and check that out until next sunday see ya